Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to the third um, Q&A session of the North East Cambridge Area Action Plan. My name is Terry D'Souza. I am a Principal Planning Policy Officer at the Greater Cambridge Share Planning Service, and I'm going to be your host today for this session. Uh, I'm very pleased to say that we have um, a number of people joining us today um, on our panel who will hopefully be able to answer all your uh, interesting and really relevant questions on water and climate change, which are very uh, important and key topics, um, not only for North East Cambridge, but generally for, for Greater Cambridge um, overall. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to run through um, how the session is going to run today. So there's just going to be a quick introduction uh, where everyone will introduce themselves. And I'll also set out some of the kind of housekeeping rules about how you can ask your questions and how the team will answer those. Um, my co-host, uh, Emma, will then um, do a short presentation on not only the area action plan, but provide some details as to what the kind of climate change and water policies um, say in the plan. Uh, and then it's over to you. And you have the opportunity to ask us questions. Uh, and as I said, we will do our best to answer those for you. Now, the way you do that is very simple. At the bottom of your screen, there will be a button that will say Q and A. Uh, within that, you can type in your question and you can do that either anonymously or you can put your name against that. And the team will then pick those up um, as the session goes on. Now, um, in previous sessions, we have run out of time um, to answer all of the questions. So what we've done previously is we will get through as many as we can within the hour. And then after that, um, any questions that we aren't able to answer live, we will then provide a written response to those and put those onto the council's website alongside a recording of this Q&A session. Now, the recording, um, it won't show any of the people that are there um, watching us. It's, it's only going to be the panelists and myself that will be visible on the screen. So you don't need to worry about you being visible to, to the world. Um, and uh, we won't be reading out any names either when we're answering uh, answering your questions. Um, so without further ado, I'm just going to now introduce my co-hosts and fellow panellists. So I'll first turn to Emma. Okay, good afternoon. I'm Emma Davis. I'm the Principal Sustainability Consultant for the Greater Cambridge Shared Planning Service. So I'm here to provide a quick presentation and then ask any kind of climate change and sustainable construction specific questions that you might have. Thank you, Emma. Uh, I will then now pass over to Julia. Oh, Julia, I think you're on mute. Sorry. Hi, sorry about that. My name is Julia Beden. I work for the County Council. I'm the Flood Risk and Biodiversity Manager. And um, although I haven't been as directly involved, my team works across uh, this project with a number of um, colleagues from the, the Greater Cambridgeshire Partnership. Um, we're looking at the ecology and surface water flood risk impacts of this site going forwards. Thank you, Julia. And Harry? Good afternoon, my name is Harry Pickford. Um, I work for the County Council as well as a Sustainable Drainage and Flood Risk Officer. Um, it's kind of commenting on planning as it comes through the surface water impacts on this development. Thank you, Harry, that's great. And Louisa? Hi, I'm Louisa Nunes. I'm Drainage Engineer for Cambridge City Council. Um, I've been involved uh, giving advice to the planning team on flood risk sustainable drainage policy for this site. Thank you. And Matthew. Hi, well, I'm Matthew Patterson. I'm the project lead developing the uh, Northeast Cambridge Area Action Plan on behalf of the Shared Planning Service. Great. Thank you, Matt. Um, so people who will be watching will also see my colleagues, Joe and Hannah on the screen. Um, Joe and Hannah are providing invaluable technical support um, with this, with this Q&A and others. Um, so just in case you're wondering who they were. Okay, um, I should also say that there's no chat facility within, within the webinar. It is just a, a Q&A session. So uh, as I said, please feel free to ask questions. Um, you can do so any point from now on. Uh, and we will um, start, I think, with the presentation. So Emma, if you'd be able to um, run through the presentation, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, of course, thank you. Just wait for the screen to start sharing. Oh, there we go. 
Okay, so uh, welcome all to this Q&A session where we are focusing on uh, climate change and water for you today. So if we move on to the next slide, I'm just going to give you a very brief overview of the site. So we're looking at 180-ish hectares of brownfield land um, in an area of the city that's got good transport accessibility already um, and which will improve significantly over the coming decades. Uh, the site is a 15 minute cycle ride from the city centre and we've got a range of landowners on the site which is one of the reasons why we are looking to produce a coordinated planning framework for the site. The site is also strategically important not just for the Greater Cambridge area, so Cambridge and South Cambridgeshire, but also for the wider region which includes the Oxford Cambridge Arc. Uh, but what we're very clear on is that the development of this site must also benefit local communities so it needs to address deprivation and also ensure integration. So the next slide um, will take you through what, what is an area action plan. So basically it's a planning framework to guide the development of a specific area and it has equivalent status to a local plan. So the document will set out the spatial framework for how the development will uh, come forward and it sets out a range of thematic policies. It's supported by a very extensive evidence base, uh, so there are various studies and also topic papers and it will go through an examination process with an independent planning inspector prior to its adoption. So moving on next now to our vision for the site. So we really want North East Cambridge to be an inclusive, walkable, low carbon new city district with a lively mix of homes, workplaces, services and social spaces, which is fully integrated with surrounding neighbourhoods. So the next slide will take you through just some of the headline figures for the site. So at the moment, site, it's 182 hectares of land. There's 15,000 jobs currently on the site and just three homes. Um, there are also 4,400 unused car parking spaces on the site. And as we've already mentioned, it's 15 minutes from the city centre by bike. In the future, what we're looking at is around 8,000 new homes on the site for around 18,000 residents. And 40% of those homes will be affordable. We're looking at 20,000 new jobs being created across the site in many different sectors. And also we're looking at the creation of 10 hectares of public parks and squares. There'll be three new primary schools for the site, a new library, and we'll be looking at around 10 new or improved walking and cycling connections with the rest of the city and surrounding area. So next slide really, and now focusing in on the purpose of today's session, which is climate change and water. I don't think you need to start with the site itself. It is a highly sustainable location for low carbon living. And through the Area Action Plan, we're going to ensure that new development takes a holistic approach to designing for both climate change mitigation, which is reducing emissions, and also adaptation, so making sure that the site is resilient to future climate change. The development of the site will also have to support the transition to net zero carbon. Now, if you've already looked at the Area Action Plan, there's no specific carbon reduction targets in there yet. And that is because we're actually working at the moment on a piece of evidence base that will develop those carbon reduction targets, not just for the Area Action Plan, but actually for Greater Cambridge as a whole. And we've got the local plan happening kind of in parallel to this process. We are also going to be developing an, uh, an energy master plan for the site. So that's a document that will identify the energy systems required to support those carbon reduction targets and also the infrastructure required to facilitate their delivery. And also we're working on a water cycle study that's being developed, uh, which is looking at both flood risk and also water resource availability and water infrastructure. And that's a document that we're going to have independently peer reviewed by a specialist in this sector. So moving on to my next slide, as I've already mentioned, this is a really good site for low carbon living. Um, it's a site that already benefits from good sustainable transport links. So we've got Cambridge North Station, there's the bus route, and we've already got some good cycle links on the site, all of which will be improved. 
the area and action plan really focuses in on the creation of compact, livable and walkable communities. It's making use of an existing brownfield site rather than a greenfield site. So what this allows for is a higher density development and also a mixed use development, meaning that the development will be more walkable and it would be, will be more energy efficient than you would get with a lower density development. Next slide is really what's some of what's key in all of this is the opportunity that this site presents for low carbon travel and it presents an opportunity for a major shift in travel behaviour. So we're very clear that the car will not be king on this site. The site is going to be designed for walking, cycling and public transport to make active travel the natural and obvious choice for people living and working on this site. There are a number of ways in which we can discourage non-essential car use. So, for example, thinking about quotas and also parking restrictions. And one of the clear benefits of this is that we will actually see an improvement in air quality and well-being benefits for everyone who's currently affected by the levels of transport on Milton Road. So next slide is um, this is kind of a, a, a slide that's showing you some of the opportunities on this site for designing for the climate emergency. So policy two of the area action plan is our climate emergency policy. And this diagram here sets out some of the opportunities to integrate climate resilience into the design of the built environment. So looking at things like enhancing green infrastructure through planting trees, through using green and brown roofs, all of which helps to keep buildings, streets and spaces cool. We're looking at requiring external shading and overhangs on buildings to help reduce overheating. And we're also talking about things like using cool materials, and also looking at integrating water and sustainable drainage systems into open spaces. And then the next slide, which is my last slide before I hand back to Terry, um, is some of the water issues. Now we know that water is a very sensitive issue for kind of Greater Cambridge as a whole. The Area Action Plan sets out a number of policies on water. There's a water efficiency policy in there. Now, some of you may know that we are slightly hampered in the water efficiency standards that we can require of new development because government have actually restricted us to only be able to set a certain level of water efficiency from new housing development. But we are looking to introduce policy in the area action plan that will encourage and incentivise developers to do better. We've also got policy in there requiring the use of sustainable drainage systems which are systems that are integrated into buildings and into landscapes to slow the flow of uh, flood water but also deliver other multiple benefits including biodiversity enhancement and also amenity benefits. To inform policy as already mentioned we're working on an integrated water management study and this will identify what water resources are available for the future growth and will also help to identify what infrastructure in terms of water supply and also wastewater will be needed. And I think that's it from me, so I'll hand back to Terry briefly. Thank you, Emma, that was really helpful. Um, so before we get started, we had a few questions come through kind of on social media and things that people have been asking. Uh, so we thought we'd put them into the beginning of the Q and A session just to um, just try and address some of those some of those questions. Um, so we've got various members of the team that are going to uh, go through these questions. So the first question that we have is, how will the scheme deal with flood risk? I'm going to pass over to my colleague to pick that up. I can answer this one. Um, so the development proposals will require a strategic flood risk assessment. Um, and the, the strategic flood risk assessment is being carried out for uh, uh, Cambridge, City Council, Cambridge City Council and South Cambridgeshire. Um, and, with, and of course, the uh, Northeast Cambridge is included in this area. The study uh, is going to look into assessing flood risk from different sources and uh, looking at the effects of climate change. Um, this study will be available, is, is being carried out by a consultant, Stantec, uh, and is, we are aiming to have a draft in September. Uh, there is also some stakeholders involved, environment agency, 
lead local flood authority, water companies, um, and as the individual development proposals come forward for the Northeast Cambridge, we can then identify which sites are uh, within the flood risk zones. Um, and if the site, a specific site is in the flood risk zone, there will be a need of uh, a specific flood risk assessment for that development. Um, there will be also to minimize the flood risk, there is be also uh, implementation of sustainable drainage um, measures uh, for all sites, even with, without being in the flood risk zone. Um, those standards and expectations uh, for the sustainable drainage uh, are drafts in the policy for C, flood risk and sustainable drainage. Uh, I think, yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> that's great. Thank you, Louisa. Okay, then we have another question, uh, and this will be going to, uh, sorry, Julia, and it will there be enough water for the proposed development? Hi. Okay, so there's the three um, effective levels of this um, question to, to tackle. There's the local level in terms of the building design and the development design. There's then what's happening as part of the local plan and what's happening uh, on a more regional basis to, at which the water companies work. So, so first of all, in terms of the development it's, itself, um, a, a, a large number of different um, regulators and stakeholders are obviously either involved in or um, you know, in a role which, whereby they'll be approving these designs. So there's a lot of very close working uh, from the local level right up to the more regional level with the uh, water companies and with the developers. Um, and it is going to be an area where everything is managed very, very carefully. Um, there's very significant awareness of the local concern around water resources. So everyone's working very closely together and developers will be expected to demonstrate that all proposed development will be served by an adequate water supply. So in terms of the development itself, buildings will be designed to reduce water by over 15% compared to the current average for Cambridge. Uh, the proposal is also that the new development must achieve as a minimum water efficiency which is equivalent to 110 litres per person per day. There will also be, um, as Emma mentioned, um, a desire for mains water consumption of actually 80 litres per person per day to be achieved um, and this we hope can be used, can be achieved using rainwater harvesting and various other methods of water recycling. So um, weight will be afforded to, to try to encourage that to happen. Um, as I mentioned, there is that limitation from, from government, unfortunately. So proposals for non-residential development must also achieve five BRIAM credits for water use, that's policy WAT01, unless it can be demonstrated that that really is not economically or technically viable. So that's what we're looking for, five BRIAM credits for water use. So in terms of the local plan uh, at the next level for all the, the developments, um, as Louisa mentioned, the consultants Stantec have been appointed to carry out a strategic flood risk assessment. They're also carrying out an integrated water management study. And the point of this is to provide a robust evidence base for the local plan to support that uh, plan's development. And this includes um, looking at the NEC um, Air Action Plan site. So the aim of the study is to look at all aspects of the water environment, to consider the sustainability of the growth that is being proposed and what water infrastructure will be required, and then to work out what measures are needed to manage and protect the water environment. So it's very much a case of as you said, looking at all of that growth and working out what is needed along in partnership with um, the water company, so Cambridge Water and, and Anglian Water, to make sure that that uh, infrastructure you know, is, is going to be able to be provided. The study will identify what resource, water resources are available for future growth um, and then will help the councils looking at different possible growth scenarios. The water resources element of the study is also going to be independently reviewed by a national recognised expert in this field to ensure rigorous scrutiny. So as Emma mentioned earlier, that's the peer review. So the consultation encourages comment and feedback on policies 4A, which is water efficiency, and 4B, which is water quality. Uh, and ensuring a supply for the draft air action plan. 
so then just briefly at the, the wider scale, um, many of you may be aware of water resource management plans. These are water company plans that plan for 25 years and these are updated every five years. And the current one for Cambridge Water is 2020 to 2045. Um, and at that much more regional level, the water companies are working together to try and work out how they are going to provide water resources for the future. And this is looking at much broader scale measures around whether the county needs more um, reservoirs, um, how they can reduce abstraction from groundwater uh, and therefore provide uh, greater resilience for our chalk streams. Uh, it's also going to be looking at water transfer with other regions. Uh, and in order to do this in the best possible way, what's happened is a lot of the water companies in the region have clubbed together to create Water Resources East, which was also mentioned earlier. And through that organisation, they will be developing um, some quite broad ranging and hopefully quite innovative solutions to, to tackle this for the long term so that that work can underpin uh, any kind of growth in the, the local plan. OK, that's all from me. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Julia. Okay, um, and then the next question we have is, uh, how does the draft area of action plan help address climate change? And I think uh, Emma will be able to help yeah. with that. Okay, so um, section 4.1 of the draft area action plan sets out to designing for the climate emergency. So in terms of addressing climate change, and I'm going to focus in a little bit here on kind of climate change adaptation, is that policy will require all development to be climate proofed against a range of different climate risks. So this includes flood risk and water availability that uh, Julie's already touched on and Lisa, and also risks such as overheating, which is becoming quite a critical area uh, that we're experiencing. So in order to minimise the risk of overheating, for example, uh, the Area of Action Plan requires all development to apply what is known as the cooling hierarchy. So this is a looking at ways to reduce the amount of heat entering buildings, primarily using um, energy efficient design, using uh, measures to reduce heating, such as reduce heat entering buildings, such as um, looking at orientation of buildings, the amount of fenestration, but also looking at things like shading, the use of cool materials, green roofs and wider green infrastructure. And it's looking at those kind of passive design measures before we then start to think about having to use uh, mechanical means of ventilation with air conditioning being the absolute last resort. We're also going to require all development to undertake overheating analysis using kind of industry guidance um, and we're asking them to do that using future climate scenarios as well under a 2050 climate scenario. Um, and also when de designing for overheating risk, they also need to take account of the external environment and any constraints that there might be. So thinking about noise, air quality and that sort of thing. So I think that's probably enough for that for now. Thank you, Emma. Okay, and then the final question before we get on to um, the questions that are coming in at the moment. Well, you know, this is this is a good question because um, you know the draft area action plan talks about how this would be a, a green development um, and very sustainable. But will this development actually be net zero carbon? So, uh, Matt, uh, hopefully you'll be able to answer that question for us. Thanks, Terry. Yeah. So, uh, yes, the draft northeast area action plan has been fundamentally shaped really by the requirement for it to be low carbon, low impact and to, um, and to meet our requirements regarding uh, net biodiversity increase. So therefore development at North Cambridge uh, must support the transition towards uh, net zero carbon society. And in that context, development must minimize the carbon emissions associated with the operational energy and construction, including materials as well as wider emissions, for example, those associated with transport. Development has to be supported by decentralised energy, uh, low carbon energy, combined with smart approaches to energy uh, infrastructure, including energy storage, which is um, policy three. Um, achieving net zero carbon requires us to rethink all aspects of planning and placemaking, not just about how the buildings are designed and constructed, but also about siting development, where it will be well served by public transport, cycling and walking, as well as renewable and low carbon energy. Proposals uh, should be future proofed as well to enable future occupants to easily retrofit and upgrade buildings and or infrastructure in the future to enable achievement of a net zero carbon development. 
Um, we're currently working with Bioregional to develop an evidence base for net zero carbon policies in the local plan. And we'll use those to define targets and policies for inclusion in both the AAP, but also in the local plan. And that works not just looking at energy use in buildings, but also issues like transport and embodied carbon, as well as when development should achieve net zero carbon. So for now, we have a placeholder in policy two in the AAP, and that's where we're at. Great, thank you, Matt. Okay, so two of the questions that we've had through so far, I think I'm going to try and group them together and probably send them over to your way, Emma. Um, so many moons ago, I attended a presentation at then Newhall College on water management strategy for the area, what happened? And um, the Environment Agency had written a letter on the 7th of August saying, they determined that current levels of abstraction are causing environmental damage. Any increase in use within existing license volumes will increase the pressure on a system that is already failing environmental targets. How do you reconcile, reconcile development with an acknowledged lack of water resource? Now, I think Julia probably picked this up a little bit in her response, um, but uh, Emma, it'd be good if you could just, um, just touch on those um, a little bit, please. That'd be great. Yeah, okay. So I think the first question, I think that actually relates to the water cycle study that was produced to support our existing local plans, which was produced by, I think it was Halcro. Um, I think the date on that document is 2011, something like that. Uh, so that was a document that informed policy development for our existing local plans. Now, that document did actually recommend in terms of water efficiency, a figure of 80 litres per person per day, which is the policy that we had in our draft local plan. Uh, and unfortunately, that policy was removed from the local plan by the planning inspector. Um, this links back to what I mentioned earlier about us being restricted uh, in the policies that we can set. So that is a, an issue for us moving forward and something that we are looking at as part of the new kind of integrated water management study that we've already referenced and that Julia has referenced. The Environment Agency, I believe, are on the steering group for that particular study. So we are working very, very closely with the Environment Agency, the water companies and also other groups involved in the water environment, because we do know that this is a critical issue that needs to be addressed across all sectors, not just new development, but every area of water use really does need to consider how we can reduce water demand so that we have long-term sustainable supplies of water resources. So that is something that is being looked at in great detail as part of the integrated water management study and looking at, you know, what can we do to perhaps go further than we are currently able to uh, in local policy. Conversely, we can set whatever water efficiency standard that we can for non-residential development. So the, uh, the, the standard that Julia referenced, which is the maximum credits from uh, the BREAM certification process, that is the highest standard of water efficiency that you can actually get from non-residential development. So it is a key issue moving forward and one that we are looking at with our various partners as part of the integrated water management policy and also considering what we can do in terms of lobbying for, for powers to, to set more uh, stringent water efficiency standards. Okay, thank you. And then there's a follow-up question to that, which is about the time scales for new water resource are far longer than the time frame for development. Um, Judy, is that something you might be able to? Yeah, pick that's, up on? that's fine. So yes, that that is is true in terms of if um if the solution is to develop a new reservoir, for example, that is obviously a very long term plan. Um, so that's why uh, the water resource management plans are planned for twenty five years. But you're right in the in the short term, that's why it's imperative that the development. Um, does consider to take as, as much action as it can and the things that Emma and I have mentioned in terms of reduced water usage. Um, but the, if you look in the water resource management plans for Cambridge Water and Anglian Water, um, it is you know, it's reassuring to know that they are working together and that these issues, are, there's, there's nothing new for those water companies. The Environment Agency in the, um, has been making the water companies aware of the, this concern for, for a while and the, the partners are working very closely together uh, to try and look at solutions. So there are um, proposals to try and look at some quite short term solutions to improve the resilience of the chalk streams. So I think you'll hear over the next kind of year, um, the ne next 
probably six months or so, um, the water company through Water Resources East looking to try and create some local projects working with um, local partners like the catchment partners and um, with the, the district councils and, and others and local landowners to try and work out what they can do on a short term basis. Um, and I think the priority is very much about that resilience for, for chalk streams um, because everyone is aware not just it's not just about the water resource levels but about when that water is in, abstracted from the, the chalk streams, the impact that that then has on the habitat and the biodiversity of those streams. So it is very much a, an issue um, that people are aware of. And I think the, the public pressure, you know, has uh, to a certain extent been a really good thing because it has meant that that issue really stays at the top of that agenda. Um, and I think um, there is, is there's definitely going to be some movement over the next few months as um, we start to, to look at, um, you know, how we can take some of those projects forward in the short term so that then there's methods in place so that the long-term schemes can then pick up from from there um, there's certainly been a discussion with the county council um, with south camps and with some farmers um, in some of the catchments about whether we can get together and, and start a project so that's something that we're all quite excited about doing and, and very much watch this space oh good thank you julia okay we've got another question um one of the previous slides had somebody holding a carrot uh, which i think um sparked sparked the question so what provision will this development make for residents growing food which is a key element of a low carbon community we need dedicated facilities including allotments and community gardens so that's a really good question so uh matt is that something you could take on please yeah sure um so a key requirement of the aap is to require uh the master planning of the area to be landscape led and it's purposely done so and the, the open space environment within NEC has to work really hard. It has to deliver on the biodiversity agenda, our working and cycling agenda. Um, it has to deal with the climate change as well in terms of trees and planting uh, for cool. Um, but alongside that, the amenity spaces that are provided are there for recreation purposes, for uh, proper amenity purposes, but can also be providing uh, for community gardens, allotments. In particular, we're looking at green roofs, which are um, equally able to cater for uh, community gardens and the like. And um, part of this will come down to the planting strategy of the landscaping proposals as well. What we're looking for there is um, things like community orchards as part of those landscape strategies uh, and making provision for growing. Thank you, Matt. I know some of the community orchards um, in the city at the moment are extremely popular, aren't they, um, within local, for local communities? So, yeah, yeah. definitely something that we'll be looking to, to, to build on, really, for North East Cambridge. Yeah, and you can build a lot of that into the landscape strategy that you put in place. Um, you know, a landscape doesn't necessarily just need to be, um, you know, uh, uh, of nice trees and things like that, but they can be functional as well in terms of herb planting and other types of planting that can deliver on that. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we've uh, got a question about, uh, it's quite relevant actually, as soon as the weather we've been having recently. So St. Nick's was hit by flash flooding not so long ago. How will you deal with this now? Um, um, now that we've got this raised risk, especially during the summer. So um, is that something, Louisa, that you might be able to answer, please? So with the climate change, uh, we will see that the rainfall will be quite frequent and like flash floodings will appear more in the summer. Um, so in terms of the, de the design, we expect the systemic drainage uh, to accommodate the climate change allowance um, to prevent you know, to, to accommodate the, the, the rainfall, this in, intensive rainfall. I know if Julia and Ari, do you have anything yeah, to add? Should, should I come in? So, yeah, as Louisa mentioned, there's obviously um, work that needs to be done at the site detail, and that's what Louisa and Harry will review in, in detail as the applications uh, come, come forward, but very much along the lines that Emma's mentioned around sustainable drainage systems, um, you know, holding back that water so that it doesn't have a, an impact downstream, and then obviously wherever possible, providing betterment. But just for the wider context, um, there, there is a, a you know, growing obviously concern across the country about flash flooding. This is what we call surface water flooding, or you, you may hear it referred to as pluvial flooding. And the Environment Agency has just released its new national strategy. So it's the, um, 
national flood and coastal erosion risk management strategy that was just um, released for um, public awareness last week as that's uh, sorry week before last I think as that's now going through parliament for approval and that recognises that um, increasing risk of all sorts of flood risk uh, as Louisa mentioned through climate change but for surface water that's an area that um, that my team at the county council and also uh, Louisa's team are very very aware of and um, the county council have a, a duty to prepare a local flood risk management strategy which we will update now that the national strategy has been uh, approved and um, we look very much to um, to try and work with existing communities that have that have that risk uh, to see what we can put in place with them to uh, to manage the risk better and i think one of the difficult things as louisa mentioned because climate change is going to have a significant risk um, is balancing that against the infrastructure that we have in this country at the moment because the types of rainfall that we're seeing and we haven't got the figures yet but i suspect for certainly it will prove that um that the drainage itself in terms of the existing highway drainage probably had a very minimal effect on the, the rain because i suspect the rainfall was so heavy um, that it was uh, of much greater quantity than could be coped with by any uh, any highway or local infrastructure on that that scale and what that means is that for all of us across the country, we're going to have to be much better prepared for this kind of rainfall. Um, obviously, in terms of replacing you know, huge swathes of infrastructure, that's a massive project and will, will take time and, and cost money. So we're all going to have to be much more, uh, much more prepared. And while the emphasis is on the individual landowners to, uh, to manage their prop the risk to their property, and that involves things like working community to do community flood plans and personal flood plans, we want very much to work with you with the water companies like Anglian Water, with uh, the environment agency and across the district and, um, and council partners and also internal drainage boards where they exist in the, the area uh, to try and find, you know, solutions that we can take this forward what i would do though is just say if we do have any flash flooding in any of the areas just to urge you to report that because the county council can only take forward projects and investigations about areas where it, it's aware that internal flooding to properties has happened um, so just to put a general plea out there for anyone that is aware of uh, flooding to internal properties to please report that to the, the county council so that we can then look to, to make improvements um, but i think the focus here is very much on the site we've got a new development and we've got that opportunity to make sure that that site does have a, a really fantastic drainage strategy and incorporates things like green roofs and, and fantastic sustainable drainage systems that do uh, not only reduce the, the risk, not only, sorry, not only prevent there being an increase in risk, but also um, reduce that risk and, and provide betterment to the current situation. Thank you, Julia. Uh, we were talking earlier actually about when there is flash flooding and who that gets reported to and how there's a bit of ambiguity out there as to, you know, who do you contact? Do you contact the council or, you know, the fire brigade or others? So it's helpful that you um, you added that in there because I don't think people really know because I don't think they come across it very often. So I think it's it's quite good yeah. to know that if it does happen. It's a very then, then situation as well. It's something that I think don't I think any of us would have chosen for government to give us this um, this messy picture. You know, with having water companies, district councils, county councils, highways internal drainage boards, environment agency, everyone has a different role in flooding. And I think that's incredibly confusing for the public and not something that any of us would wish on it. So I'd always say, um, you know, they're very welcome to, to report the flooding to us as the lead local flood authority, and we can make sure uh, that the right people, um, are, you know, then dealing with those reports. Thank you. Uh, we've got some more questions about allotments, but before that, uh, I'm just going to stick to the water theme for just a second for one more question. It said, will some of that water be collected to water the green spaces within North East Cambridge? So, um, Emma, you're nodding your head, so that might be a question that might be coming your way. <laughs> yeah, that's quite a common approach, actually, in a lot of schemes that we come that come forward. And it's something that our landscape architects will often look at is, is what is the strategy for actually watering? open spaces and they will establish much more successfully if they are actually watered with rainwater. Um, so I would say it's something that we will be looking for in terms of the long-term management and maintenance of those open spaces. Yeah and I know uh, in the actuary action plan itself it talks about um, sort of drought resilient um, landscaping as well to make sure that we're not increasing the problem in terms of water usage um, and trying to make sure that the landscapes and sort of public realm um, are resilient to, you know, the, climate, the, the changing weather patterns that we're seeing at the moment. So, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, OK, coming back on to the allotment question, which seems to be a, a popular one. So um, there's some scepticism about, um, about green roofs uh, and whether that, whether that um, will provide um, you know, the allotments that, that people are going to uh, need. And also um, talking about how you know, within, within, within parishes, 
there is a you know there's a real there's a real requirement um, that you know new homes provide allotments. Um, so what does what does the city council say in terms of its sort of planning obligations or planning requirements on allotments, uh, and how will how will that be picked up as I suppose as part of the North East Cambridge development as sites come forward? Yeah, so I can deal with the first one. Um, green roofs are only part that they're potentially a small part of what we're talking about in terms of. Um, space for growing food, really. Uh, what we're talking about is within the wider open space and amenity space that's provided within the schemes, landscape surrounds, but roof gardens can provide a component of that as well. Um, in terms of um, allotments themselves, the local plan standard is a requirement of 0.4 hectares per 1,000 head of population. Um, we are looking towards meeting that, but it may be that that is better met rather than through allotments, through um, community garden space um, that more people can then obviously access and share and co looking at co-joining those with schools and things so that the children get involved in, in growing and understanding how plants are growing early in. Right, I'm on mute there. Yeah, yeah, and there's just a follow up question I think on that was about um, talking about the standards, which I think you've already mentioned that. Um, recognising that North East Cambridge isn't, um, it's not an urban extension, but it clearly needs significant provision given the absence of allotments in nearby Orchard Park um, and what growing areas on the ground will there be? I think you've sort of covered that a bit in, in your response already. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, we, we've got the allotments next door to the site that are already there. Um, we would be looking to make complementary provision on site, but like I say, I think whether it's allotments in the traditional sense or whether you're looking at more community garden growing areas. Cool, thank you. Okay, um, but I think that's a really good point actually, and I think if you know, with all of the, the things that we're talking about today and others, you know, if people have you know real strong kind of views and thoughts on on these topics, then you know we would, you know, we really really encourage you to. You know, firstly, thank you for taking part in the Q&A, but to actually put in your comments formally through through the consultation process, because that is really how we're going to um, be able to, you know, um, understand what the, the concerns are of, of local people um, and how we can then try and address those as we as we seek to finalise the plan um, over the next uh, over the next months and, and years before it gets adopted. So, so yeah, just a just a plug really for the to the consultation, just to make sure you get your comments in in writing. Um, that would be really good. Okay, um, so. Moving away from water and allotments now, uh, going on to mid construction materials. So what requirement is being placed on developers to use low carbon construction materials to limit embedded carbon? That sounds like an Emma question. <laughs> that does sound like an Emma question. Okay, so this is quite an interesting area actually, and it is quite a critical area for net zero carbon because dealing with energy use in buildings is actually quite easy to do and the embodied carbon in materials is quite a big proportion of a building's energy use. Now it is an emerging area because at the moment in the UK there's no one defined way of actually calculating embodied carbon. So what we've done for now is we've again it's a kind of placeholder that we've put into uh, policy two of the area action plan. So we will be requiring all developers to minimise carbon emissions associated with uh, embodied carbon. And we are asking them to use a specific um, way of calculating that. And I think we refer them to uh, what's in the, I think it's the RICS Embodied Carbon or Climate Emergency Design Guide. So that's what we're using for now, because that's kind of, one of the established methodologies, but I think there's a lot of work still to be done on actually defining a really good tool for calculating embodied carbon. And it's something that Bioregional are looking at for us as part of their work on net zero carbon. So when we've got the outputs for that study, which should be later this year, we can relook at that part of the policy. And if we need to slightly amend that policy we can do but yeah we are certainly wanting all development to be calculating uh, and limiting uh, the amount of embodied carbon in materials used. Sorry I'm on mute. <laughs> Follow-up question to that 
Um, can you insist that uh, RICS or Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors standards are met? It's a very good question. I think we can only try. Um, this, as okay. far as I'm aware at the moment, there aren't any other local plans adopted that have got embodied carbon policy requirements. Um, so it is an area that I would say we're possibly testing through the area action plan and also through the local plan. But the RICS targets are quite widely used already in the construction industry. So I would hope a lot of the developers that we will see on site will already be quite familiar, which is why we went for the RICS um, approach for now, because it's probably the most familiar approach to the widest part of the construction industry. Okay. And then one of the questions that I was actually asked on the first webinar, and I thought it was probably more appropriate for this one, was about timber framed buildings and about how, what sort of, you know, there's a big push at the moment, I think centrally from government about, you know, looking at other methods of construction. Uh, and timber is obviously one that is getting a lot of international attention. Um, in, and just, you know, what role could timber frame buildings have at North East Cambridge? And how does that help if, if at all in terms of, you know, um, carbon reduction and you know sustainable construction in general really yeah so yeah there's nothing in the area action plan to prevent timber frame construction being used and it's already quite a popular approach certainly in residential development um, you see the use of a lot of timber in modular construction for example and cross laminated timber which is a very kind of strong structural type of timber is becoming more and more widespread. Um, so some of that would get picked up in that kind of embodied carbon approach. The area action plan does require kind of life cycle analysis as well. So there is a bit of debate amongst architects as to what is a better performing uh, material when you look at life cycle and take into account things like, you know, if you're using concrete frame that might give you slightly better thermal mass and helps to cool the building reducing cooling loads so there is a bit of a kind of argument about what's the best technique but i think certainly we may well see more timber construction um, for some of the the buildings coming forward um, it becomes slightly trickier when you get to slightly taller buildings because building regulations requirements kick in as well and they, they will sometimes limit the use of timber for structural elements but I think certainly we'll, we'll see it uh, coming forwards more and more. Thank you, sorry I keep forgetting to unmute. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, right, we've got 10 more minutes uh, in, as, in this uh, Q&A, so if there's any more, any more questions people like to ask, please, please do um, ask them in the Q&A function at the bottom. Like I said, if we don't manage to get through them all, we will um, provide written responses and put those online uh, within the next couple of days. Um, just to give you uh, just a quick update in terms of what's coming up moving forward, we do have four, four, oh, it's got five on there, five more Q&A sessions lined up. Um, the next one is on open spaces and biodiversity, uh, and that's on the 26th. Uh, and then, as you can see, we have a few more themed sessions before we have a more general one to conclude on the 21st of September, which is just a couple of weeks before the consultation closes, which um, the date for the diaries is 5 p.m. on the 5th of October. So if you are going to respond to the consultation, please make sure your comments are with us by then. Um, and there's a lot more detail on the website, uh, on the council's website, as to how you can engage in the process. Uh, details on the screen now. Okay, so before uh, we run out of time, we've got some questions here. Um, okay, so we've got one about, <laughs> okay, for amusement. I note that timber was used for the framework of the roof at York Minster after it burnt back in the 80s. I would have thought that that was a tall building. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, um, and we've got one here about basements uh, okay so it's very often deep basements and underground car parks require more concrete and embody more carbon will you refuse permission for these oh, that's a really good question actually so um emma is that something you might be able to help with or is it a map oh question? that's an interesting question i'm not sure what the response is because we do actually see quite a lot of basements um, and they're used for multiple uses so they you know they do provide basement parking they also provide plant space um, but undoubtedly they do 
have quite a, a high embodied carbon requirement. Um, so I think some of the work that's ongoing, looking at you know targets for embodied carbon might help with some of that. There are some benefits when you're digging a basement though, in that you could actually be at the same time thinking about putting in ground source heat pumps. So there are possibly some advantages with that approach. I think in terms of the car parking, obviously the standards within the area action plan will hopefully be reducing the amount of car parking spaces anyway. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's a really interesting question. And I think with more work done on embodied carbon and coming up with actual targets for that, that would hopefully help to limit some of that. Yeah, just to add, I don't think we're really looking at underground basement car parking uh, at NEC. Uh, the proposal here is to look at uh, car barns more than anything else. So it's car storage. And we're looking at... Um, those are sort of multi-story car parks more than underground basement parking within buildings. Um, and then even then they'd be wrapped around if you like with other uses around them. Um, and, but as, as Emma says, uh, if there are basements going in, certainly um, to, to could be for any purposes really, cycle storage and, and other things, um, you could look at how you the other benefits that could be delivered from those as well in terms of heat source pumps i think you ended on the right word because the next question was I so mean, are heat are heat pumps part of planning part of the planning process i think you want me to pick up on that one yeah Terry? you can go for him yeah. <laughs> i suspect we will see a shift to heat pumps we're already seeing quite a shift towards heat pumps in applications coming forward now, that's partly linked to government's proposals to ban new gas boilers in new homes from 2025, um, and certain most commercial developments and non-residential developments coming forward now are either using ground source or air source heat pumps. That is one of the things that we will be looking at as part of the energy master plan work as well, is what sort of technologies are there out there to help support the targets that will be in the area action plan. So I think we may well be seeing a bit of a mix of technologies really, but I think certainly we will be moving towards electric forms of heating for this site. Um, and you could see possibly um, you know, district scale heat networks powered by heat pumps. I don't want to preempt the work, but um, certainly this development is of a scale that that sort of approach could be possible. And a follow-up question to that then, Emma, is so you talk about the energy master plan and it was in the presentation at the beginning, but what happens if a developer or a landowner doesn't want to sign up to the energy master plan for the site? Would you have a, like a gap? Would they kind of be allowed to do their own thing? How, how would that work? They would need to provide justification as to why they couldn't sign up to the energy master plan. I mean, that energy master plan is going to be subject to uh, viability testing as well as being a technical piece of work. So I think, you know, any proposals to move away from that energy master plan, which will be required through policy, uh, there will need to be some quite detailed justification as to why it cannot be implemented for a particular site. I mean, the whole idea is to try and take a more efficient approach to energy across the whole site and to also integrate that with utilities infrastructure as well. Um, so anything that kind of goes outside of the master plan, it could be that there isn't sufficient infrastructure to support that approach anyway. So hopefully if we can work with landowners and bring them on board with this energy master plan as well it will get delivered and will deliver a much more appropriate response for a development of this scale great thank you emma okay we've just got a couple of more minutes left um one question that really came through um particularly from councillors actually during um before we were well when we were seeking authority to consult um, it's about whether we're setting a high enough standard for new homes and, and, and uh, workplaces um, in relation to kind of carbon standards or, or could, could we should we be doing more? Um, Matt or Emma, I suspect they're probably questions for either of you. I think those are really... Yeah, I think, I mean, it's a good challenge by members and I think it's right to challenge mm -hmm. it and to push the targets as far as we can. 
you're, we are slightly hampered in that um, we were hoping such targets would come from national and be led by national planning policy. And rather, unfortunately, the MPPF and others have um, gone slightly the other way in terms of, you know, we were ramping up to code for sustainable homes six at one point, and then we were going to be net zero carbon by 2025 or 2030, I think it was originally. Um, and those targets have slowly gone away, really. Um, and it's been left to the local authorities to try and forge ahead and try and deliver on the aspirations that I think we all want to see, which is to, to drive towards net zero carbon. But at a time when um, potentially, you know, uh, the government's priority is around building um, building beautiful, but building lots and lots of homes um, and probably at, at the at a cheaper level than than we would want and at a lower quality of standard than we would expect, I think, well, um, and want through policy, certainly. So I think it's right that we are uh, certainly trying through the AAP to uh, push the boundaries of what is achievable. And we're doing that, in essence, through doing an AAP for what is a large area, which enables us to do this at scale, so that when we come to the individual development plot, hopefully it's a much easier ask of the developer to deliver that if we've got the wider infrastructure put in place to help them achieve net zero carbon from the outset. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with everything that, that Matt has said. We, we do encourage the use of other standards as well. So I know members are particularly keen on things like passive house. Um, so we do encourage the use of that through uh, the, the area action plan and I think also one of the things that the bioregional work is looking at is how to express standards and how to, you know, is carbon reduction the right, the right approach or should we be looking at kind of energy intensity metrics which really drives down energy demand in buildings. So it's, it's quite a new area for us and I would say we are going much further than we've ever done before in policy so it's but yeah i think you know we need to be challenged on these things as matt has said absolutely brilliant thank you emma okay that pretty much draws us to the end of the time i just want to say thank you to the person who um shared a link about how you could report flooding um from the central government website so that's really helpful so thank you uh, i think we can actually put that in the um in our written response that goes with the um that goes with this video online so that if anyone's watching this um on demand so to speak then they they, they can they can see where that is so that'll be really helpful so thank you okay um so thank you very much to everybody who has joined us today i hope we um, answered your questions uh kind of as fully and comprehensively uh as you were hoping um you know this is a a big development um you know it, very exciting but doesn't come without its challenges um climate change and water is definitely one of those so you know we're really really keen for you to provide us with your feedback on the draft plan uh you know are we are we doing enough enough should we, we should we be asking developers for more um so yeah so please do provide your feedback before the before the consultation deadline um there's a lot more information on our website there's um faq videos about you know the, the plan in general and, and some specific topics as well um, and there's also a feedback form as on the um, on the Q&A session so if you have any comments um, or, or you want to tell us how you thought that the event went today or, or previous sessions have gone then we would really welcome that um, you know these are these are new to us you know we've never done webinars before as a as a local planning authority it's, this is uh, strange times that we're living in but we, we are hoping that these sessions are are, provide, are are helpful and useful to you they're not quite the same as speaking to you all in public uh, in public places face to face but i think um given where we are at the moment um these are you know hopefully a, a good a good alternative option but yes but um and just to say thank you very much for joining us and also to my co-presenter emma and all of the other panelists as well for taking the time today um to to be here so thank you very much goodbye <laughs>